Chapter 9 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 9 Chivalry or Villainy. From her cabin port upon the Kincaid, Jane Clayton had seen her husband row to the verdure clad shore of Jungle Island and then the ship once more proceeded upon its way. For several days she saw no one other than Sven Anderson, the Kincaid's taciturn and repellent cook. She asked them the name of the shore upon which her husband had been set. I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard, replied the Swede, and that was all that she could get out of him. She had come to the conclusion that he spoke no other English, and so she ceased to importune him for information. But never did she forget to greet him pleasantly, or to thank him for the hideous, nauseating meals he brought her. Three days from the spot where Tarzan had been marooned, the Kincaid came to anchor in the mouth of a great river, and presently Rokoff came to Jane Clayton's cabin. "'We have arrived, my dear,' he said with a sickening leer. "'I have come to offer you safety, liberty, and ease. My heart has been softened towards you in your suffering, and I would make amends as best I may. Your husband was a brute. You know that best who found him naked in his native jungle.' roaming wild with the savage beasts that were his fellows. Now I am a gentleman, not only born of noble blood, but raised gently as befits a man of quality. To you, dear Jane, I offer the love of a cultured man in association with one of culture and refinement, which you must have sorely missed in your relations with the poor ape that through your girlish infatuation you married so thoughtlessly. I love you, Jane. You have but to say the word, and no further sorrow shall afflict you. Even your baby shall be returned to you unharmed. Outside the door, Sven Anderson paused with the noonday meal he had been carrying to Lady Greystoke. Upon the end of his long, stringy neck his little head was cocked to one side. His close-set eyes were half-closed. His ears, so expressive was his old attitude of stealthy eavesdropping, seemed truly to be cocked forward. Even his long, yellow, straggly mustache appeared to assume a sly droop. As Rokoff closed his appeal, awaiting the reply he invited, the look of surprise upon Jane Clayton's face turned to one of disgust. She fairly shuddered in the fellow's face. "'I would not have been surprised, M. Rokoff,' she said, "'had you attempted to force me to submit to your evil desires, "'but that you should be so fatuous as to believe that I, "'wife of John Clayton, would come to you willingly, "'even to save my life, I should never have imagined. "'I have known you for a scoundrel, M. Rokoff, "'but until now I had not taken you for a fool.' Rokoff's eyes narrowed, and the red of mortification "'flushed out the pallor of his face. "'He took a step toward the girl, threateningly. We shall see who is the fool at last, he hissed. When I have broken you to my will and your plebeian Yankee stubbornness has cost you all that you hold dear, even the life of your baby, for by the bones of St. Peter I'll forego all that I had planned for the brat and cut its heart out before your very eyes. You'll learn what it means to insult Nicholas Rokoff. Jane Clayton turned wearily away. What is the use, she said, of expatiating upon the depths to which your vengeful nature can sink? You cannot move me either by threats or deeds. My baby cannot judge yet for himself, but I, his mother, can foresee that should it have been given him to survive to man's estate, he would willingly sacrifice his life for the honor of his mother. Love him as I do, I would not purchase his life at such a price. Did I, he would execrate my memory to the day of his death. Rokoff was now thoroughly angered because of his failure to reduce the girl to terror. He felt only hate for her, but it had come to his diseased mind that if he could force her to accede to his demands, as the price of her life and her child's, the cup of his revenge would be filled to brimming when he could flaunt the wife of Lord Greystoke in the capitals of Europe as his mistress. Again he stepped closer to her. His evil face was convulsed with rage and desire. Like a wild beast he sprang upon her, and with his strong fingers at her throat forced her backward upon the berth. At the same instant the door of the cabin opened noisily. Rokoff leaped to his feet, and turning, faced the Swede cook. Into the fellow's usually foxy eyes had come an expression of utter stupidity. His lower jaw dropped in vacuous harmony. He busied himself in arranging Lady Greystoke's meal upon the tiny table at one side of her cabin. The Russian glared at him. "'What do you mean?' he cried. "'By entering here without permission. Get out!' The cook turned his watery blue eyes upon Rokoff and smiled vacuously. "'I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard,' he said." and then he began rearranging the few dishes upon the little table. 
"'Get out of here, or I'll throw you out, you miserable blockhead!' roared Rokoff, taking a threatening step toward the Swede. Anderson continued to smile foolishly in his direction, but one ham-like paw slid stealthily to the handle of the long, slim knife that protruded from the greasy cord supporting his soiled apron. Rokoff saw the move and stopped short in his advance. Then he turned towards Jane Clayton. "'I will give you until tomorrow,' he said, "'to reconsider your answer to my offer. All will be sent ashore upon one pretext or another except you and the child, Paulvitch and myself. Then, without interruption, you will be able to witness the death of the baby.' He spoke in French that the cook might not understand the sinister portent of his words. When he had done, he banged out of the cabin without another look at the man who had interrupted him in his sorry work. When he had gone, Sven Anderson turned toward Lady Greystoke. The idiotic expression that had masked his thoughts had fallen away, and in its place was one of craft and cunning. "'Hey, tank I been a fool,' he said. "'Hey, been the fool. I savvy French.' Jane Clayton looked at him in surprise. "'You understand all that he said, then?' Anderson grinned. "'You bet,' he said. "'And you heard what was going on in here and came to protect me?' "'You bang good to me,' explained the Swede. "'Hey, treat me like dirty dog. "'I help you, lady. "'You yes wait. "'I help you. "'I been vast coast lots times. "'But how can you help me, Sven?' she asked. "'When all these men will be against us.' "'I tank,' said Sven Anderson. "'It blow pretty soon pretty hard.' "'And then he turned and left the cabin.' Though Jane Clayton doubted the cook's ability to be of any material service to her, she was nevertheless deeply grateful to him for what he had already done. The feeling that among these enemies she had one friend brought the first ray of comfort that had come to lighten the burden of her miserable apprehensions throughout the long voyage of the Kincaid. She saw no more of Rokoff that day, nor of any other until Sven came with her evening meal. She tried to draw him in the conversation relative to his plans to aid her, but all she could get from him was his stereotyped prophecy as to the future state of the wind. He seemed suddenly to have relapsed into his wonted state of dense stupidity. However, when he was leaving the cabin a little later with the empty dishes, he whispered very low, Leave on your clothes and roll up your blankets. I come back after you pretty soon. He would have slipped from the room at once, but Jane laid her hand upon his sleeve. My baby, she asked, I cannot go without him. You do what I tell you, said Anderson, scowling. I been helping you, so don't you get too funny. When he had gone, Jane Clayton sank down upon her berth in utter bewilderment. What was she to do? Suspicions as to the intentions of the Swede swarmed her brain. Might she not be infinitely worse off if she gave herself into his power than she already was? No, she could be no worse off in company with the devil himself than with Nicholas Rokoff, for the devil at least bore the reputation of being a gentleman. She swore a dozen times that she would not leave the Kincaid without her baby, and yet she remained clothed long past her usual hour for retiring, and her blankets were neatly rolled and bound with stout cord, when, about midnight, there came a stealthy scratching upon the panels of her door. Swiftly she crossed the room and drew the bolt. Softly the door swung open to admit the muffled figure of the Swede. On one arm he carried a bundle, evidently his blankets. His other hand was raised in a gesture commanding silence, a grimy forefinger upon his lips. He came quite close to her. "'Carry this,' he said. Do not make some noise when you see it, it being your kid. Quick hands snatched the bundle from the cook, and hungry mother arms folded the sleeping infant to her breast, while hot tears of joy ran down her cheeks, and her whole frame shook with the emotion of the moment. Come, said Anderson, we got no time to waste. He snatched up her bundle of blankets, and outside the cabin door his own as well. Then he led her to the ship's side, steadied her descent of the monkey ladder, holding the child for her as she climbed into the waiting boat below. A moment later, he had cut the rope that held the small boat to the steamer's side, and, bending silently to the muffled oars, was pulling toward the black shadows up the Ungambi River. Anderson rode on as though quite sure of his ground, and when after half an hour the moon broke through the clouds, there was revealed upon their left the mouth of a tributary running into the Ungambi. Up this narrow channel the Swede turned the prow of the small boat. Jane Clayton wondered if the man knew where he was bound. She did not know that in his capacity as cook, he had that day been rowed up this very stream to a little village where he had bartered with the natives for such provisions as they had for sale, and that he had there arranged the details of his plan for the adventure upon which they were now setting forth. Even though the moon was full, the surface of the small river was quite dark. The giant trees overhung its narrow banks, meeting in a great arch above the center of the river. Spanish moss dropped from the gracefully bending limbs, 
and enormous creepers clambered in riotous profusion from the ground to the loftiest branch, falling in curving loops almost to the water's placid breast. Now and then the river's surface would be suddenly broken ahead of them by a huge crocodile, startled by the splashing of the oars. Or, snorting and blowing, a family of hippos would dive from a sandy bar to the cool, safe depths of the bottom. From the dense jungles upon either side came the weird night cries of the carnivora, the maniacal voice of the hyena, the coughing grunt of the panther, the deep and awful roar of the lion, and with them strange, uncanny notes that the girl could not ascribe to any particular night prowler, more terrible because of their mystery. Huddled in the stern of the boat, she sat with her baby strained close to her bosom, and because of that little, tender, helpless thing, she was happier tonight than she had been for many a sorrow-ridden day. Even though she knew not to what fate she was going, or how soon that fate might overtake her, still she was happy and thankful for the moment, however brief, that she might press her baby tightly in her arms. She could scarce wait for the coming of the day, that she might look again upon the bright face of her little black-eyed Jack. Again and again she tried to strain her eyes through the blackness of the jungle night to have but a tiny peep at those beloved features. But only the dim outline of the baby face rewarded her efforts. Then once more she would cuddle the warm little bundle close to her throbbing heart. It must have been close to three o'clock in the morning that Anderson brought the boat's nose to shore before a clearing where it could be dimly seen in the waning moonlight a cluster of native huts encircled by a thorn boma. At the village gate they were admitted by a native woman, the wife of the chief whom Anderson had paid to assist him. She took them to the chief's hut, but Anderson said that they would sleep without upon the ground, and so, her duty having been completed, she left them to their own devices. The Swede, after explaining in his gruff way that the huts were doubtless filthy and vermin-ridden, spread Jane's blankets on the ground for her, and at a little distance unrolled his own and lay down to sleep. It was some time before the girl could find a comfortable position upon the hard ground, but at last, the baby in the hollow of her arm, she dropped asleep from utter exhaustion. When she awoke it was broad daylight. About her were clustered a score of curious natives, mostly men. For among the aborigines it is the male who owns this characteristic in its most exaggerated form. Instinctively, Jane Clayton drew the baby more closely to her, though she soon saw that the blacks were far from intending her or the child any harm. In fact, one of them offered her a gourd of milk, a filthy, smoke-begrimed gourd with the ancient rind of long curdled milk caked in layers within its neck. But the spirit of the giver touched her deeply, and her face lighted for a moment, with one of those almost forgotten smiles of radiance that had helped to make her beauty famous both in Baltimore and London. She took the gourd in one hand, and rather than cause the giver pain, raised it to her lips, though for the life of her she could scarce restrain the qualm of nausea that surged through her as the malodorous thing approached her nostrils. It was Anderson who came to her rescue, and, taking the gourd from her, drank a portion himself, and then returned it to the native with a gift of blue beads. The sun was shining brightly now, and though the baby still slept, Jane could scarce restrain her impatient desire to have at least a brief glance at the beloved face. The natives had withdrawn at a command from their chief, who now stood talking with Anderson, a little apart from her. As she debated the wisdom of risking disturbing the child's slumber by lifting the blanket that now protected its face from the sun, she noted that the cook conversed with the chief in the language of the negro. What a remarkable man the fellow was indeed! She had thought him ignorant and stupid but a short day before, and now, within the past twenty-four hours, she had learned that he spoke not only English but French as well, and the primitive dialect of the West Coast. She had thought him shifty, cruel, and untrustworthy, yet in so far as she had reason to believe, he had proved himself in every way the contrary since the day before. It scarce seemed credible that he could be serving her from motives purely chivalrous. There must be something deeper in his intentions and plans than he had yet disclosed. She wondered, and when she looked at him, at his close-set, shifty eyes and repulsive features, she shuddered, for she was convinced that no lofty characteristics could be hid behind so foul an exterior. As she was thinking of these things, the while she debated the wisdom of uncovering the baby's face, there came a little grunt from the wee bundle in her lap, and then a gurgling coo that set her heart in raptures. The baby was awake. Now she might feast her eyes upon him. Quickly she snatched the blanket from before the infant's face. Anderson was looking at her as she did so. He saw her stagger to her feet, holding the baby at arm's length from her, her eyes glued in horror upon the little chubby face and twinkling eyes. Then he heard her piteous cry as her knees gave beneath her, and she sank to the ground in a swoon. End of 
Chapter 9